Hello and thank you for watching this video about multicast DNS. This is a follow-on to the router advertisement video I did last week. Now multicast DNS also works for IPv4, but really it is sort of a part of stateless auto configuration, which of course is introduced by router advertisements. If you're interested in more about IPv6, again, we do have the IPv6 summit coming up July 6th in Washington, DC. To register, just see isc.sans.edu slash IPv6. And we also have a discount code IPv6 summit 10 if you want to use that for a 10% discount. So with stateless auto configuration, we assume that we don't really have any local infrastructure. We have a router and that is it. Everything else is auto configured, including that router and resources will register themselves. That's really where multicast DNS comes in. Like I said, it does exist in IPv4 and Apple calls it bonjour and probably that's sort of the most widespread implementation of multicast DNS at this point. There are two specific multicast groups that go with multicast DNS in IPv4. It's 224.0.0.251 and in IPv6 at FFO2, of course, FFO2 being the link local scope for multicast and FB is really just 251 in hexadecimal. Instead of port 53, multicast DNS uses port 5353. Now, the protocol is really derived from DNS. So we will see the standard DNS message structure. We do have two bytes for a query ID, two bytes for flags, then the number of questions, answer, authority, and additional records. Finally, we do have the actual records. The queries themselves are containing a query name, a type, and a class. So for example, if we are looking up the A record for isc.sans.edu, the query name would be isc.sans.edu, the type would be A, and the class would be IN for internet. The answers are a little bit more complex. We do again have the name for, to which the answer applies, the type and the class. That's essentially what we had in the query. Now, each response, each answer or resource record also contains a TTL telling us how long this resource record is valid for, then a length and then the respective data that goes with that answer. Now here quickly for types and classes, we do have our types like A for an A record IPv4, quad A for an IPv6 address, the name servers record or the text record. And of course there are many, many others, MX records for mail servers, service records, and so on. As far as classes are concerned, you really should only see the internet class as far as multicast DNS and such is concerned. So that would be class number one. And multicast DNS reinterprets this class a little bit by using the first bit to indicate whether or not we are expecting a unicast or multicast response to our query or in a response we would set the bit number one if we want the recipient of the response to flush the cache. Typically, TTLs define how long a record is being stored. However, in multicast DNS, we assume a dynamic self-organizing network. So we may want to indicate that a record needs to be replaced before its TTL is coming up. And that's where this cache flush bit is coming in. 
And then we have the .local top level domain. This top level domain is reserved for link local multicast DNS records. So if I'm registering my host name via multicast DNS, I would use hostname.local. This is important because we cannot and should not use the .local top level domain outside of multicast DNS. This causes conflict sometimes where networks use dot local sort of as a local top level domain that they manage themselves don't do this it will conflict with these auto registers domains but enough with powerpoint does this actually work in real life so let's get started and collect some packets. I do have my iPhone set up here. Currently Wi-Fi is turned off on the iPhone and we will use TCP dump on a Mac here that's connected to the same network to collect the packets. Next, we'll turn on Wi-Fi on the iPhone. And as soon as we flick that switch, we will see multicast DNS packets from the iPhone. In addition to the iPhone, we also have a system here that identifies itself as MacBook 2. And you can see where the iPhone registers itself using IPv4 as well as IPv6. But now let's take a look and try and ping that host name that the iPhone here registered for itself. So ping iPhone-5.local. And it takes a second to actually do the lookup here. And then you see the ping succeeds. If I'm doing the same now for ping six, then it will do a DNS lookup for the quad A record. And I am now able to ping the link local address for this iPhone. And then I have a number of resources here, really only two. And the most important one here is the second one, multicastdns.org. You will find links to other references, like, for example, this IETF draft that I linked here. And thanks again for listening. Again, my email address is jolrich at sans.edu. If you would like to learn more about the IPv6 summit, isc.sans.edu slash IPv6. And don't forget the discount code IPv6 summit 10. Thanks and talk to you again soon. Bye.